Tonight we're talking about an autopsy of a dead church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This was the message we were supposed to give last Sunday night, but we had to take a trip to Somersville instead. You got to hear Brother Ted. It says, it's Jesus speaking, remember? He says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? He who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, <clears throat> and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not spoiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. <clears throat> and I will not erase his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for these messages to these churches in the book of Revelation. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight through them. Teach us. Lord, help us to understand and know your will and your way for our lives. Lord, help, help us to know how we as a church can mature and, and grow and repent, Lord, and, and turn to you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. Father, we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Imagine you're crawling through the desert, just scorched, near death, crawling across this hot, burning desert, dying of thirst, close to perishing, but ahead you see a sign that reads, cool, clear, life-giving water just five miles ahead. The sign, of course, would give you maybe a little renewed in energy, uh, new hope, and you'll continue on now. Uh, even though it, it's still a tormenting crawl, perhaps, across the part of sand, but as you arrive at the promised place, you see a magnificent building. Just, you know, it just looks beautiful to you. Uh, the sign invites you in, even beckoning you with the promise of life-giving water. So you crawl through the entrance into a glorious building, and there uh, before you is this promised well, uh, the bucket ready to, to be let down and filled with water to quench your thirst and to pour life back into your body. Uh, with the last bit of your strength, you lower the bucket into the well, expecting a splash as the bucket hits the water. But it never comes. The only sound is the dull thud of a bu bucket hitting the, the bottom of an empty dry hole. You think that perhaps you're, you're just delirious, so you reel in the bucket and all you find inside is dust. Dust that certainly can't quench your thirst, but dust that instead just deepens the, your thirst and destroys all your hope. Maybe that sounds far-fetched, but this is really the experience of a lot of people who, who go to God's house expecting to be filled, expecting to be fed with the water and the bread of life, only to find all the trappings of the rituals, but no real help, no hope uh, for all that's made their way there. They, they find nothing at all. This was the condition of this church that we're thinking about tonight, the church at Sardis had taken on the character of the city, unfortunately, that it resided in. A little background on the city of Sardis maybe will help us understand the condition of this church. Sardis was the capital city of Lydia. Uh, it was founded about 1200 BC. The original city sat on top of a 1500 foot uh, high plateau. Uh, there was one narrow road leading up into the city. The other sides of this plateau were just steep cliffs. And this made the city very safe and, and nearly impenetrable by 
invading armies. Sardis was the home of Aesop. You know, his, his famous fables have been heard by children all over the world. Gold and silver coins were first minted here in Sardis. Uh, the city was, was famous for the industries that operated there. Carpet industry, wool, dyed cloth were the primary products that they made. It said that the art of dyeing was invented at Sardis. At one time, Sardis had been one of the greatest cities in the world. It, it reached its zenith under King Croesus. King Croesus and Sardis were famous around the world because of their wealth. And, and in that part of the world, it's still common to hear the phrase, as wealthy as Croesus. Uh, while Sardis reached its zenith under this king, it also fell under, under his reign. It fell. Uh, he and, and the people of the city became complacent in their wealth, in their power, the, the city's apparent invincibility. Uh, when that reign where Sardis, uh, uh, or in that region, in that area of the country where, where Sardis was located, when it came under attack by Cyrus, uh, the Persian king, King Croesus and his people retreated to their city, believing they would be safe there. But one night, one of the Persian soldiers saw a Sardinian soldier drop his helmet over the, the wall of the city. And, and he watched as that soldier followed a hidden path down the side of the mountain to retrieve his, his helmet. Well, they, they learned the secret of how to get there, in other words. And, and so when nightfall came, Cyrus and his troops followed that hidden path up the side of the mountain and entered the city while the, the guards slept and, and ended up conquering Sardis. Sardis regained eventually some of its former wealth under the reign of Alexander the Great, but was invaded and defeated by Antiochus the Great, who also entered the city at night while the guards were sleeping. Seems to be a recurring problem for them. When the Romans came, Sardis was still a wealthy, powerful city, but it, it really was just a, a shell of its former self. And by John's day, when, when this book of, of uh, letters here in Revelation was written, Sardis was just a shell of what it had been. The, the people had grown lazy. They were degenerate, immoral, complacent. It was a dying city because of their apathy, because of their indifference, that the city was proud of its past and proud of its reputation, but its reputation was really all it had left at this point. And, and for all intents and purposes, the city of Sardis was dead even while it lived. Uh, apparently, the church in Sardis had adopted the, the same atmosphere of the city. Uh, it had become kind of a thermometer that registered the temperature of the city instead of a thermo thermostat. Uh, in, you know, a thermo it, it, instead of being the thermostat, it should have been that would change the temperature of the city. They were just registering what it was. It's to this church that had become lazy and apathetic and complacent that the Lord Jesus comes in this letter uh, just as surely as the city of Sardis was dying, the church was dying as well. And Jesus has no words of commendation for this particular church. But he does have some words of counsel. And I'd like for us to look now tonight at our Lord's words to this dying church. There, there's a word of warning for us, I think, in these, in these verses as well. So, and let me remind you, these letters can be viewed three ways. Practically, these letters were written to real churches with real issues. Prophetically, these letters uh, picture the church at various stages in history. This particular church has been, it's been suggested, pictures the period between 1500 and Jesus' eventual return. It, it pictures the Protestant Reformation. It, it pictures dead orthodoxy. It pictures the state of many churches in our world today. We describe them as plateaued and declining. And then thirdly, it, it, it also suggests uh, a personal uh, thing. These, these letters have something to say to every church and to every believer who comes under the sound of their message. I want to consider the, the words of Jesus to this church tonight and, and, and see that he has something to say to them and therefore has something to say to us as well. Let's, let's listen in as Jesus, the great physician, 
performs this autopsy of a dead church. To begin with, we hear the Greek physician's pronouncement in verse 1. Three parts to his pronouncement. First, he comes proclaiming his deity. He comes to this church as someone who, it says, has the seven spirits of God, as one who was holding the seven stars. These seven spirits of God, of course, refer to the Holy Spirit in his complete ministry. Uh, the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit is defined in Isaiah 11, 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In his hand is the, the plenitude of the Holy Spirit, the completeness of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a reminder to the churches that we're to operate not under the power of, of our own human skill and in our our own human leadership and organization, but we're to operate under the awesome power of the Holy Spirit. And when the church walks in the power of the, of the flesh, surely we'll fail. But when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, there will surely be success. There'll be glory, there'll be power and life instead of deadness and ineffectiveness. When the, when the human spirit is in control of the human body, amazing things uh, might be accomplished, but we know for certain when, when the, the Holy Spirit is in control, amazing things will definitely be accomplished. For instance, you know, a, a pianist can sit down at a keyboard, perform thousands of delicate, precise movements that will produce beautiful music. However, let that same pianist suffer some injury that, that leaves the arms paralyzed and the mind no longer in control of those arms and hands and fingers, and then try as he might, the human spirit can't will the hands to make music. So too, when the Spirit of God is in control of the members of the church, great things can then be accomplished. However, when he's not, uh, the result is paralysis and nothing can be accomplished for God. These seven stars are the pastors of the churches. Uh, they're the messengers who bring the, the people the word of God. And, and Jesus appears as one who has everything the church needs to in order to succeed. His spirit has all the power the church is needed. Uh, his word has all the direction uh, that the church needed. And, and Jesus seems to be saying, if you'll submit to me, you'll find in me everything you need uh, to accomplish my mission in this world. And that, that's a message, of course, the modern church today needs to hear. People are trying all sorts of methods, every method under the sun to reach sinners and to do the work of the church, but all the power we need is found in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and in God's Word. Uh, what we need isn't necessarily a new method, but a new desire to seek the fullness of, fullness of the Holy Spirit and, and do everything according to the teachings of the Word of God. And the second part of Jesus' pronouncement is that He comes proclaiming His discernment. He tells them, I know your deeds. I've seen you. He comes as someone who sees all, knows all, and, and doesn't commend their deeds. He doesn't, at the same time, though, condemn their deeds. He merely tells them that he knows everything they're doing. He knows everything we're doing as well. He sees it all, along with the motives that drive us to do the things we do. He, he sees us as a whole, and he sees the individual as well. He knows our hearts. He knows everything you do. He, he knows why you do it. And that's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? That, that God knows all of our motivations. The, the third part of Jesus' pronouncement is that he, pro, he comes proclaiming his diagnosis. Apparently their works gave them the appearance of life. But Jesus tells them that they, they, they have that reputation. They were a busy working church, a, a great reputation among men. From all outward appearances, this church was everything a church ought to be. They believed the right things. They were busy doing good all over the community. Everyone who saw them looked at them and said, you know, that church is on fire. Man, they're really moving for God. And I'm sure that when people moved to Sardis from other towns, their pastor suggested that they should attend this, this particular church. It had all the appearance of life. But... Things were not as they seemed or as they appeared. The, the great physician placed his finger on the pulse of this church and he pronounced them dead. No matter what others thought, Jesus knew the truth and he told them the truth. 
He tells them that even though everyone thinks they're alive, they are, in fact, dead. Like a dead man, the, the church at Sardis was destitute of force, destitute of power, ineffective, inoperative. They were dead. There was activity, but it wasn't spiritual in nature. There was busyness, but they were bringing nothing eternal to pass. They were preaching, but lives weren't being changed. Sinners weren't being saved. They were busy, but they were operating in the energy of their own flesh and not in the energy of the Spirit of God. And everyone looked at them and, and spoke about their life. But Jesus, the one who knew better than anyone, looked at them and he said, you guys are dead. In other words, looks can be deceiving. These flowers uh, that, we, that we put around here, up on the table, you know, uh, have the appearance of life. They're beautiful. They're, they're not really filled with any kind of fragrance. They, they're filled with color, you know, but they're dead. They look alive, but really they're, they're dead. The same can be said about animals on display in a museum, you know. They make them look really lifelike, and, and they put them in natural habitats, but they're, you know, they're still dead. And our world is filled with, with similar kinds of fakes, things like silk flowers and wax fruit and all that kind of stuff that all look alive, look like the real thing. You could almost take a bite, but if you did, you'd be disappointed because they're dead. The polar star, astronomers tell us, it takes 33 years for the light from that star to reach the Earth. That's what science says. And if that's true, for all we know, the pole star might have burned out 20 years ago. We wouldn't know it for another 13 years because it takes 33 years for the light to get here. It, it, it looks like it's still there when you look up in the night sky when, and it, there's no clouds. Uh, but it may not be. It could be a dead star. And, and many, many churches seem to be in that same shape today. They have all the appearance of life. But the great physician has placed his finger on their pulse and knows the truth. His finger is on the pulse of Temple Baptist Church today. My question is, what do you think? Does he feel a pulse? Is it strong and steady or is it weak and failing? What does he know about our church that we may not know? Uh, here are some signs that a church is dying. Uh, it says, a dying church rests on its past accomplishments and is satisfied with its present state. A dying church is more concerned about their rituals and their formalities than they are about spirituality. A dying church is more concerned about social change than they are about seeing people change by the power of God. A dying church is more concerned with material growth than it is with spiritual growth. A dying church is more concerned with pleading men than it is with pleasing God. The dying church clings more tightly to its creeds and confessions than it does to the Word of God. The dying church is one that loses its conviction that the Bible is the Word of God. Those are just some of the signs I've, I've seen and read about a dying church. And here are the signs of life in a church. Let's focus on these. Growth. You know, all living things are characterized by growth. And as long as you and I live in the bodies that we're... You know, we're maturing, we're changing, we're growing, and the, the problem is that when growth stops, it means we're dead, and the church is no exception. When people think of growth in the church, they immediately think of numerical growth, and I think that is certainly a, a strong part of it. But the primary way a church demonstrates life is through spiritual growth, the, the individual members growing. A church that's alive continues to develop spiritually. When a church ceases to grow spiritually, it, it degenerates and dies. Uh, a second feature is harmony. When a physical body develops problems, it's because there's disharmony in the body. Cancer is a good example of that. Some, some of the cells become infected by the cancer and, and they attract other cells in the body. And, and if that's left unchecked, the result will be disintegration and, and, and death for that body. And the same is true in the church. When, when a church is alive and well, there'll be unity, there'll be harmony in the fellowship. When there isn't uh, that, then the body is diseased, it's headed for trouble, uh, unless the infected parts come back into harmony. 
When a church becomes fractured, it, it's headed for disaster and for death. Uh, thirdly, a third feature is emotion. Uh, we see this in the physical realm. Uh, because I'm alive, I can laugh, I can cry, I can feel pain, I can feel joy. I have emotions and they demonstrate the fact that I'm alive. When, when a physical body dies, one of the clearest indications is the total lack of emotion now. The face doesn't, doesn't change, you know, the, the muscles no longer function to, to show that emotion. The deceased person doesn't show one sign of emotion, and, and they can't, of course, they, they're dead. Again, the same is true in the church. A living church is an emotional church. Now, some more emotional than others. Uh, there'll, there'll be times when we all laugh together. There'll be times when we weep together, uh, when we shout together, when we sing together. Uh, when we hurt together, uh, when we pray together. In other words, when there's life, there's emotion. Another sign of life is motion, movement. Physical bodies are bodies in motion. And, and one sure sign of death is the absence of motion. When, when there's life in the church, there'll be motion. There'll be movement. You know, some people worry about children. Uh, I'd like them to not be terribly loud, but uh, I'm not too bothered by children in church because that is a sign of life and that will also give us a lot of evidence of motion uh, and, and the church then you know is active in the world doing the work of, of the Lord through this motion so how do we measure up do we exhibit the signs of life or the signs of death I don't think we're dead but I do think we could show more signs of life than we than we do uh, so, okay, we first heard the physician's pronouncement. Next, let's, let's listen to the, phys the great physician's prescription here. The, this church in Sardis, it's obvious, is in pretty sad shape, but it, it, there's an indication here that not all is lost yet. It appears there's still hope for them to make some changes and get back to what they need to be. And to begin with, they're commanded to wake up. They're told to wake up, and literally this means that they're to stay alert. Uh, th this church is a church with a glorious past. They've allowed their past success to lull them into this state of complacency and spiritual slumber. But Jesus calls on them now to be vigilant, to be attentive. His command is for them to wake up and realize the victories of yesterday are not sufficient for today. And, and the people in Sardis would, would have understood exactly what Jesus was talking about. As I mentioned earlier, Sardis was located on the, the top of this mountain, essentially, this plain, but there were cliffs on the side, so it was like a mountain. And it had one entrance on the southern side, which was the only way you could get into the city in the old days. And therefore, all that Sardis had to do was to, to put a, a detail at that place and detail the soldiers and, and have them watch the city and guard the city. But on two occasions, as I mentioned in their history, they've been invaded by their enemies because they felt secure and so secure, believing their hill was impenetrable, the, the guards went to sleep on the job. And in, in 549 BC, the soldiers of Cyrus scaled the parapet, and then again in 218 BC, Antiochus the Great captured Sardis because of this soldier who slipped over the walls while the centuries were being careless. And, and when, we, when we allow ourselves to sleep and, and become careless in this way because of what we've enjoyed in the past, we're going to find ourselves conquered by the enemy. Uh, this happens far too often in the churches. A, a church will struggle in the, in the beginning of its life, and the poor group who founded that church will have to work and pray and witness and give and, and yield to God to see the church stay alive and then eventually grow. And over time, more people come in and more money comes in and buildings are built and, and more, more staff and, and the good services are enjoyed by all the people. And yet, in the midst of all these good things, something terrible can happen. The, the church begins to lose the vision that made them so strong in those early years. And, and they become content to just kind of sit back and enjoy the fruits of their labors. And, and while we ought to be thankful uh, for what the Lord has done for us, we'll never reach a place where we can let up and retire. There's no time to look back to yesterday. Our vision ought to be for today and for what God has for us tomorrow. You know, look around. We're aging. 
we'll take our place. Uh, look around. What is our vision for the future? Uh, we need to look around at what's going on. And, 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 you know, we're satisfied with what we have. And we've lost the fire that made us strong. Uh, we have to fight this tendency to become still and satisfied and complacent and apathetic. The second part of the prescription is that they're told to work. The Lord gives this, this church four activities that they're to be busily engaged in. And these, these things will help any church that's been caught napping on Jesus. Uh, four things. Revive. Strengthen the things which remain, he says. Tells them that they're not everything, that not everything about them has died. There are still some things that have a spark of life in them. And these things are to be revived before they die out. Uh, the phrase, which we're about to die, literally, literally means that are knocking on death's door. And, and this is a call for them to get stirred up again and for the things, uh, get stirred up for the things of God. And, and a, a strong call to revival. Uh, Jesus says, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. That means that their works are incomplete, uh, not reaching heaven yet. It's, they still have more time to work. Uh, they have some things in their midst that are good, but, but there are works that need reviving before they'll make an entrance uh, into heaven, before they'll make an eternal difference uh, for heaven. They were singing, they were praying, they were preaching and giving, but their works weren't, weren't accomplished yet. There was still more to do. Uh, a dead people doing dead works. It, it's possible to be busy in the things of God and yet be doing nothing for God. And that certainly describes what was going on with them. And unless our works are complete, they'll never reach heaven. And they'll ne there'll be no glory for God in heaven until we accomplish those things. Secondly, to remember. He says, so remember what you have received and heard. These people are, are, are you know, told very simply and very plainly. Remember where the Lord brought them from and what he's done for them. And they're to remember the days when they served the Lord out of a glad heart and, and, and wanted more than anything else to do His will and there to remember what it was like to walk in the power of God and, and while the fire of His glory burned in them and, and He used them for His glory. And, and we need to remember the God who makes churches great for His glory and seek Him again. Thirdly, the word is resolved. It says, and keep it. This church is told to, to keep it or, or hold on to the things that are still alive in their midst. They're to resolve before God that they'll not do, they'll not allow those things that are about to die to die as well. And, and in other words, we must not revive one thing while we let another thing die. What we're looking for is, is a total transformation that preserves the living things and revives the dead things. Fourthly, the word is simply repent. In this verse, they're, they're confronted about sin. And, and when the things of God are allowed to die, the only recourse the church has is repentance. And, and the idea of repentance is a foreign thing to a lot of folks today. Uh, people seem to have the opinion that whatever they want to do is just fine and dandy with God and everybody else. And, and we should just all accept that. But God isn't obliged to accept things we do if we're not doing them according to His will. He's the Creator, and our world runs according to His standard, and not our standard. We don't judge ourselves by ourselves, we judge ourselves by God's standard, His Word. When there's sin in the life of a person, there must be repentance before there can be restoration and revival. The same is true for a church, and when a church has allowed itself to be lulled into a state of slumber, their only hope is repentance. And what does it mean to repent? Well, it means that we come to a place where we experience a change of mind about our sins, and that results in a change of direction. We turn from our sins, and we turn to God, we say. Uh, repentance is, is a change of mind, results in a change of action. We behave differently after we've repented. How long has it been since we as individuals and as a church have repented before God because of our laziness, because of our complacency, our apathy, our wickedness, our deadness, whatever, you know, I can't imagine all the sins in the world and all the sins that individuals might be guilty of. You know the sin much better than I do. 
The third part of the prescription here is they're told to wait. He says, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. The church is told that if they don't, if, if they won't do the serious work of changing themselves, the Lord's going to come into their midst, take away the things that remain, and that church will be totally and fully dead at that point. And he says, like a thief, he'll come in, take the best, they'll not even know when he comes. When he goes, and they'll be in a state of total death. Uh, many churches are in that condition already today. Uh, when, when the call to repentance came from the Lord, they ignored it. They came, you know, he came into them in, in a swift judgment. Uh, and now they function the same way they always have. You know, they, they have services, they have preaching, they have outreach ministries, they give to missions, but they're dead. They're ineffective. They're not changing lives for Christ. Uh, they're merely going through the motions. They're, they have no gospel. They've, they've done away with it. Uh, there's no life in their midst. And, and Jesus has pulled the plug and pronounced them dead. And that's a situation we, of course, want to avoid at all costs. So first we heard the great physician's pronouncement. Next we heard the great physician's prescription. Finally tonight we hear the great physician's promises. Two promises. Number one is promise to the remnant. Verse 4, as, as bad as things were in Sardis, there were some there who were saved and seeking to serve the Lord the right way. They're, they're, they're given the Lord's promise that they'll walk with the Lord in white, it says. They'll, they'll, they've lived out the truth in this world and they can be confident that they'll share in that glory in the next world. White raiment, of course, was worn in, in Roman times during festivals, during times of celebration. It was a symbol of purity and victory and festivity. What a wonderful promise we have here to the faithful members of that church. He says, you know, essentially, you folks are, are standing faithful. You haven't defiled your garments with the deadness that exists all around you. And, and you're saved and you're, you're serving. And, and one day you'll walk with me in heaven it, it, and it'll be a time of victory, a time of festivity, a time of purity. And, and that's his promise for those who are saved by his grace. Promise number two is his promise to the repentant. He tells the rest here that if they'll repent and turn to him, they'll receive some very precious promises. He who overcomes, he says, will thus be clothed in white garments. They'll be made pure and victorious as well. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. They'll be made secure in the relationship with, with the Lord and, and have that promise of eternal life with him as well. And, and you know, we, we see that the majority of the people in, in the church at Sardis weren't just cold. They were totally out of God's will. They were lost and, and, and dead sinners in need of salvation. Jesus comes to them and gives them an opportunity to be saved. Uh, the last part of verse 5 says... I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In other words, someday uh, Jesus will usher his redeemed ones into the very presence of the hosts of heaven, uh, the very presence of God himself, and say, this is one of mine. He wasn't or she wasn't ashamed of me, and I'm not ashamed of this one. Uh, one of my favorite preachers is Vance Havner, and he wants commented that ministries often begin with a man who has a vision. That vision is captured by others and becomes a movement. As the movement, he says, gains followers and momentum, it becomes a machine. And after a while, people forget all about the vision and what was once a movement becomes nothing more than a monument to a man in a glorious past. There's always the danger that any church can die, he said. As Dennis Lyle has so eloquently written, Tragically, many churches are dead. Like the rotting carcass of Lazarus, these church bodies have the foul stench of death upon them. They have the appearance of life, but they are in actuality dead. Their sanctuary is a moor with a steeple. They are congregations of corpses. They have... Undertakers for ushers, embalmers for elders, morticians for ministers. Their pastor graduated from the cemetery. The choir master is the local coroner. They sing embalmed in Gilead. 
At the rapture, they will be the first churches taken, for the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The great physician has his finger on the pulse of the church and on that <clears throat> pulse of every member of the church. And, and what does his touch reveal about us, about our church, about us as individuals? I, I want to challenge each of us tonight to examine our hearts, examine the life of our church, but it begins with us as individuals. Every revival, every great awakening begins with one person saying, uh, I'm going to draw a circle on the floor, step into it, and say, God, revive everybody in here first. And then you'll be capable of praying that others would be revived as well. What does he reveal to us tonight? If, if he's spoken to you, you know, the altar's open. We all need to commit and to turn our eyes on him and, and ask him to make a difference in our individual lives, to make a difference in our church life. Let's stand together and commit to the Lord as we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus.